want to talk a little bit about general considerations when we uh, uh, when we deal with Parkinson's. And the first is, you know, not always obvious to everybody is to establish the diagnosis. So there are a lot of things that cause Parkinsonism, and they're not all Parkinson's disease. And that has a lot of implications on how you manage the patient and the prognosis. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. As I mentioned a second ago, age is incredibly important. Young onset patients have different problems than older onset, more typical patients. They are managed differently and have a different prognosis. When we're treating people, not only do we care about the diagnosis and the age, but we want to know the disability. And the level of disability depends on what symptoms they're having and the severity of symptoms in addition to the patient's background. <clears throat> so if you have uh, somebody who is, a, uh, is an artist, a little bit of tremor can be incredibly disabling to that person. But if you have somebody who's retired uh, and, uh, and uh, doesn't have to do a lot of fine motor movements, they may prefer, may not be disabling and defer treatment for that. So the level of disability for that person is, is very important in dictating what we do. All right, so when we talk about Parkinsonism, we're talking about really a bunch of symptoms, and it's, a, it's, it's really more of a syndrome, and then there are diseases associated that can cause those symptoms. So a rest tremor, for example, is uh, Parkinsonism, where an action tremor is not. Uh, stiffness, uh, slow movement, lack of movement, uh, you know, mass face that you see people with Parkinson's often have stoop posture, micrographia, and later in the disease, postural instability, so poor balance. Now, not everybody has these, especially early on, and it's not inevitable that they'll all get it, just like any disease, but it's a constellation of these symptoms um, that, we, um, uh, that we use to make the diagnosis. Um, and again, usually early on in young people, just like uh, uh, the patient that was presented this morning, you know, back pain was a problem. And I think she actually had a surgery, if I remember correctly. Many people do. I can't tell you how many young people, if they don't present with tremor, they end up with a surgery, either shoulder, back, you, so uh, before they come to us. So making the diagnosis, again, is, is really important. So the things, I don't have time because of, uh, we only have a short amount of time. I don't want to talk much about it. Just wanted to present a short list of uh, what can present with Parkinsonism that is often confused with Parkinson's disease. And uh, there are neurodegenerative processes like multiple system atrophy, frontal temporal dementias, which include PSP and cortical basal degeneration, uh, diffuse Lewy body disease, the list goes on. Those are the primary generative uh, 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 disorders that can cause it. But there are other things that can cause it that are structural or we call secondary, uh, such as vascular, small vessel vascular disease is actually a fairly common cause of Parkinsonism. Very different implications, different treatments. Uh, NPH is often uh, confused, uh, but shouldn't be, of course. Um, and then uh, medication, so we see drug-induced or medication-induced Parkinson Parkinsonism all the time. Saw so two patients yesterday at the VA for, for Parkinson's disease, and in fact, they had medication-induced Parkinsonism, indistinguishable. Okay, so rule of thumb to try to remember, you'll be right most of the time if you remember these few rules. If they have an asymmetric onset, they're dopa-responsive, and they have a rest tremor, and they don't have early falls or what we call atypical features, such as cerebellar signs, long track signs, um, early dysautonomia, they very likely will have Parkinson's disease. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to present that way, but if they have those things, you're probably right. You're going to be most of the time, about 90% of the time, predict the pathology. Okay, so this is, kind of, this is a, a patient uh, so many years ago here. Uh, who had uh, um, all the classic features. So this is off, and when we talk about off, we mean we hold their medication for about at least 12 hours. Uh, so they're very different. You can see he's asymmetric, he's got a rest tremor, more on the left than on the right. He's slow, this is real time. He's got a masked face and has problems standing. He's, he's stooped over. And very slow. So this is kind of a 
classic. He's had this for quite some time. He was another young onset patient. See how he's, when he walks, he shakes. If almost every, anybody who walks when they shake like that has got Parkinson's disease. It's a very specific uh, sign. So it's a good thing to remember. Not always, almost always. All right. So now I'm just going to talk about Parkinson's disease and not talk about the other disorders uh, because it's so common. You know, they estimate maybe a half million, a million people in the U.S. have Parkinson's, uh, get the higher incidence with age, so more people are getting older, we're having more disease. Uh, lifetime risk is somewhere um, uh, less than one in a hundred for most men, though women get it a little bit less. Um, most people get it um, around early 60s is the mean age, but there's about 15% that'll get it under the age of 50. It's still a lot of people. It's like 100,000 people, so it's actually still relatively common in the young. It's still, you know, even though it only makes a small proportion of the total population, but it's a significant population. And uh, for this group, they're, they usually become the best surgical candidates. <clears throat> All right, so just want to review the medications and point out a few things. Um, one is, you know, most of our medications are really, um, actually all our treatments are really uh, geared towards improving dopaminergic transmission. And, it, you know, even though that uh, dopamine is the limiting factor for the motor movements, there's actually, it's really much more of a diffuse disease in the nervous system. There's problems with serotonin, so they have sleep problems. They have uh, REM, pro REM sleep behavior, constipation, their Lewy bodies in their, tra in their GI tracts. Uh, it's in the cortex, so they can get some cognitive problems. It's not just a dopamine disease, but it, what works the best, it's the best treatment we have, and it does in early disease especially uh, work quite well. So it's, it's really what we talk about a lot, but we really need better treatments for other symptoms. So we have levodopa, shown in uh, the cartoon of the presynaptic neuron on the side. It's a precursor. Tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate-limiting enzyme in dopaminergic neurons, and there's not enough of them there because many of the neurons are dying. So you go upstream, uh, downstream of that, and you give them levodopa, converts it to dopamine by a, car a decarboxylase, and you increase um, transmission that way. Uh, carbidopa prevents peripheral conversion so that you don't get the side effects. And you need enough of it to prevent the side effects. So you don't get dopamine outside the brain. Uh, and then the other major class are called dopamine agonists, uh, shown there in the circle on the bottom. Uh, we have uh, four it, retigotines on hold right now. It's a patch form. But they're synthetic forms. And I'll talk in a second about uh, the pros and cons of those, but basically those are our mainstay, the agonists and levodopa preparations. Um, this also means that you don't want to do the opposite, right? So on your check sheet and your orders, whenever you have a Parkinson's patient, don't check that box to give them anti-emetics because you're going to make them worse, or an antipsychotic. Don't call in when they're sundowning some droperidol or haldol or whatever because you could kill them. So there's those automatic check boxes are the worst thing you can do uh, for a Parkinson patient. All right, so these are the guidelines. I'm not going to kind of go over this in detail. I just put it up there because there's a lot of consider this and consider that. And so it really needs to be individualized.